This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate work toward, works towards an ATE community in which evaluation is valued, systematic, and used to improve the education of technicians in high-tech fields. We do this through engaging project leaders and evaluators with information, expertise, and tools to advance high-quality evaluation. The slides from today's webinar are already on Evaluate's website, along with several other resources. You may also download these resources by following the link on the right side of your screen, and the recording will be available within a few days, and I will email that directly to you. I'm Samantha Hooker. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Lisa wilson Becho, Bianca Montrose-Moorhead, and Daniela Schroeder will be our presenters today. Lissa is the Principal Invest Investigator of Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. Bianca is a professor at the University of Connecticut, and Daniela is an Associate Professor at Western Michigan University. We'd like to thank those who've helped work behind the scenes to bring this webinar to you today, including Maureen Green. She'll be in the chat for any technical support needs you might have. Um, Lori Wingate, Carolyn williams Norin. Brianna Hook Singletary, Kelly Robertson, and Erica Sturgis. This webinar is designed for individuals funded by the NSF's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short. The ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. It funds projects in high-tech areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, IT, nanotechnologies, and more. Before we get started, I do want to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and don't necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our presenters. Thank you, Samantha. Well, I am so excited to be here today with my colleagues and esteemed evaluators, Bianca Montrose-Moorhead and Daniela Schroeder. And particularly to be here talking about one of my personal favorite topics, approaches to evaluation. So as we get started, I'm gonna actually go ahead and shut off our cameras just so we can focus on the slides, but we're gonna go ahead and turn the cameras back on during our question breaks. All right. So in our short time together today, we wanna to start off with an introduction to what do we mean by evaluation approaches and why should you know about them? Then we're going to dive into three evaluation approaches, theory-driven evaluation, practical participatory evaluation, and nation-to-nation -nation evaluation. We're going to talk about factors that influence when and why you should choose a certain approach or a mix of approaches for your project. And again, this is a crash course, so we are going to go through a lot of information, but we want to make sure that we leave you with plenty of resources so that you can continue to learn on your own or with others, we're gonna have two question and answer breaks during today's webinar, one in the middle of the webinar and then one at the very end. But feel free to enter any of your questions in the chat box anytime you think of one. We have both Samantha and Maureen who's gonna be on the lookout to make notes of incoming questions to ask for later. All right, so let's get started. You know, I said this is one of my favorite topics. I have always been really fascinated about the many different ways that someone can conduct evaluation and how different approaches and lenses on our work as evaluators affects our decision making throughout that evaluation cycle. Evaluation is not just a one size fits all. They offer unique perspectives. They shape how we gather, interpret, and use information. There are actually a lot of approaches to evaluation out there, more than you may even realize. So all of these approaches to evaluation can be really overwhelming, but they can also be exciting, right? Knowing that so many people have thought about many different ways to think about and conduct evaluation before. I know for me, it means that there's constant and continuous learning that I can do within the field of evaluation. So some of you may be asking yourself, what do we mean when we say an evaluation approach? Well, we are referring to a body of knowledge that provides foundational principles and practical guidelines for program evaluation. These approaches serve as a framework for understanding what's unique about evaluation 
and highlights ways to think and make decisions when conducting an evaluation. So while there is a body of written literature about formal evaluation approaches, as you just saw on our last slide, everyone who conducts or commissions evaluation has some kind of approach to evaluation, right? You have some type of approach to evaluation. This might be subconscious, it might be unintentional, or it might be a mix of elements from the formal evaluations you've learned about. But it can be really helpful to actually learn about formal approaches to evaluation in ways that can expand your imagination on what evaluation could look like and to make your own decision making more transparent and intentional in a way that really meets the needs of the project and the context. So we do have a number of engagement sections throughout the webinar for you and this is our first one. So this is the first chat question. We want to hear from you. Do you use a formal approach or approaches to evaluation? If so, can you share in the chat box which ones? So you can use the chat box that's on the right side of your screen to respond. And if you don't use any type of formal approach, say that as well. Yeah, so Erica says that she hasn't used any formal approach yet. Frida's the same, Gail, no formal approaches. Yeah, Mark says he uses post-event and longitudinal impact surveys. So Nate says utilization focused, developmental, theory based. Now they're coming in really fast and they're hard to read. <laughs> I see another utilization, right? Typically don't use a formal approach. Oh, Linda, you said SIP, nice. Yeah, Joy, I like that you said you're pretty eclectic, right? That's, I, I think a lot of people find themselves in that same area. Michael mentioned the CDC framework. Erica said trying to be collaborative. Yeah, you know, I, I think we find this a lot and research actually really reflects this, that, you know, people are often using kind of that eclectic approach of using a lot of different approaches. But what we hope that over the next hour, we can grow your awareness of different ways to conduct evaluation and what you might consider when choosing an approach. So, you know, again, this is really all about learning different ways to do evaluation and learning about the ways, the elements that you think about when you make decisions throughout your evaluation. So I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Daniela, to talk about our first approach, theory-driven evaluation. Thank you, Lisa. So a theory-driven evaluation approach to evaluation is just as the name suggests. That is, the project's theory of change shapes the evaluation design. All projects have an underlying theory of change. Sometimes these are formulated as a logic model that identifies project, project inputs, activities, and outputs or deliverables. Projects operate under the assumptions that if these happen successfully, then a certain set of outcomes will emerge. A theory-driven evaluation tests this if-then hypothesis. Does this logic hold? Do these activities lead to the intended outcomes? The steps of a theory-driven evaluation may seem familiar to you. First, an evaluator engages with a group of individuals who have an interest in the evaluation. Together, they refine the program or project's goals and objectives and develop a logic model that shows how the project is supposed to work. The evaluator then focuses the evaluation design by constructing evaluation questions related to testing the theory of change presented by the model. Based on the questions, evaluators then identify indicators, data sources, and methods for collecting data. Once the data is collected and analyzed, the evaluators use their findings and interpretations to justify their conclusions. Finally, the evaluator shares the evaluation conclusions and lessons learned for use by the project team. The project team uses the lessons learned from the evaluation to inform the next cycle of project work and future evaluations. 
Theory-driven evaluation is distinguished by its focus on testing a project logic model or theory of change. Evaluators taking this approach are typically looking for causal or correlational explanations for project outcomes. And interest holders like project leaders or funders are asked about their expected outcomes. While the project logic model and subsequent indicators are developed with input from the project, the evaluation process is driven by the evaluator. Also, the ultimate decision-making power about how the evaluation is conducted rests with the evaluator. Now, for each of these approaches we will talk about today, we will show you a case example to demonstrate the approach. So let's take a moment to look at the slide here. There's a lot of text. Um, I'll give you just a couple seconds. So this is a hypothetical example to apply theory-driven evaluation. Imagine you're evaluating the Advancing Technical Skills in Renewable Energy project aimed at equipping students with the skills needed for employment in the solar and wind energy sectors. Its theory of change suggests that a hands-on, industry-aligned curriculum will lead to students developing technical competencies needed to secure employment in renewable energy and ultimately contribute to, lo to the local economy. As an evaluator using a theory-driven evaluation approach, what should you focus on first to effectively evaluate the project success? Take a minute to read the response options. When you're ready, respond to the poll that should pop up on the right side of the screen. Excellent, we see all these answers fly in. And yes, B would be the first step with an evaluation that uses the theory-driven approach. Developing a logic model allows to articulate a distinct theory of change. Thank you for engaging in this example. And now I'm going to pass it on to Bianca who will talk about practical participatory evaluation. Thanks, Daniela. The next evaluation approach we want to talk about is practical participatory evaluation. Practical participatory evaluation is a highly involved approach. It requires a significant amount of time and dedication from project leaders. The first step in this approach is to ensure that project leaders understand the participatory approach and commit to it. Once they are on board, the evaluator assesses the information needs of project leaders through discussion and dialogue. During the design phase of the evaluation, the evaluator serves as a facilitator and co-develops the evaluation with project leaders intimately engaged in the nuts and bolts. Project leaders are also involved throughout the data collection and analysis phase. Project leaders take joint responsibility for carrying out these elements of the evaluation, while the evaluator provides technical support, training, and quality control. Similarly, the interpretation of the evaluation findings and formulation of recommendations are a joint effort, with the evaluator playing a facilitation role. Practical participatory evaluation is distinguished by several features. One is the role of project leaders in co-creating the evaluation. They are deeply involved in elements of both planning and conducting the evaluation. However, this involvement stays with project leaders. The approach doesn't advocate for deep participation from other interest holders, such as participants or community members. 
This approach to evaluation does involve the interpretation of findings and the development of recommendations, both of which are co-constructed by the project leaders and evaluators. Evaluators serve as facilitators throughout this process. Evaluators also serve as the technical expert and provide training to project leaders and monitor evaluation quality. The reason for participation of project leaders throughout the evaluation is to foster and promote the use of evaluation findings. The idea is that if project leaders are an active co-creator of the evaluation, they are more likely to have trust in the findings and use them for decision-making and learning. Now, let's look at how this approach might show up in a hypothetical example. This is very similar to the case that Daniela watched you through. So imagine you are once again evaluating the Advancing Technical Skills and Renewable Energy Project. The project goal remains the same, to prepare students for careers in the solar and wind energy sectors. But now the emphasis is on the project's collaborators. The project team includes instructors, industry partners, and student representatives, all of whom have an interest in the project's success and outcomes. As an evaluator using the practical participatory evaluation approach, what is the first action you should take to insert, ensure a successful evaluation? I'll stay quiet for a minute and let you read the response options. And when you're ready, answer in the poll box on the right side of your screen. I can see responses coming in. I'll give you just a few more seconds. would be the first step of an evaluation most aligned with a practical participatory approach. So if you picked A, you got the right answer. Kicking off the evaluation with a collaborative workshop focused on project leaders would allow the initial identification of information needs. So now I'm going to pass it to Samantha to see what questions you all have thus far. Samantha, over to you. OK, thank you, Bianca. Um, we actually don't have any questions yet, but please go ahead and use the chat box to enter them now and we'll go ahead and ask. Okay. What would a mix of the two approaches look like? It's a good question. Um, I uh, will say we're going to talk about this a little bit um, uh, later on in the presentation. Um, and uh, part of what we're going to talk about is the places where um, you can think about mix mixing, right? So where are some key decision points that you could think about how to mix approaches? And, and that's actually part of what we're going to cover in the next um, part of the presentation. Great question, though. Okay, thank you. And I think the next one has just been addressed as well, but what are the key decision-making points in selecting any one or two approaches? So we'll cover that after this, correct? Okay. The audience, they're on point today. Okay, how would one host a collaborative workshop for participants who've never done evaluation before? Good question. So I'll answer from the practical participatory um, approach perspective. Uh, so typically what it involves um, is uh, inviting those, right, um, the key sort of um, uh, project leaders and things like that uh, to attend a meeting. If you're in a situation where they haven't done evaluation before or they haven't done a process like what you're 
proposing because sometimes we walk into situations where people haven't, um, they've done evaluation, but maybe evaluation not in the way that we're trying to create it, right? Or sort of, um, and so, you know, you would do a little bit of evaluation capacity building at the beginning, sort of explaining what evaluation is or explaining this particular approach. And then you'd use some sort of facilitated process um, to walk them through uh, the first parts of it. So good question. Okay, thank you. Okay, and what is the difference between research questions and an evaluation plan? Ooh, I would actually like to refer you to a checklist that Laurie Wingate and I created several years ago, ago where we really look at what makes a good evaluation question. And we generally distinguish research and evaluation by who um, initiates the, the study. So for example, a research question is typically investigator initiated, while an evaluation question is usually um, initiated by interested party in parties of a program. Um, we also make sure that evaluation questions are evaluative um, rather than just uh, answering what, how questions. Um, and there are several other dimensions to this um, that would really warrant like maybe looking at this checklist and seeing how we can um, really focus an evaluation that's separate from a research study. Thank you. Okay. Is there an issue with independence of the evaluation in a participatory approach? Uh, so it depends. Um, one of the things um, that you have to think about when you're doing an evaluation is um, what are the kinds of things that people value and we all have values that we bring, right? So, um, so one of the things that I think is often intention uh, that I don't know that we talk about a whole lot in evaluation is this idea of independence um, and uh, truth. And often when I hear people sort of talk about these two ideas, what they're really worried about is somehow biasing um, information. And I think we have lots of really good ways to try to check for whether there's bias in the information we collect and in the recommendations um, that we might put together and things like that. Um, but just uh, having participation in an evaluation doesn't immediately somehow put you in the box of biasing the evaluation in some way um, or, um, or something like that or making it less rigorous. So I think one of the things we wanna to start to do is sort of untangle this idea of bias uh, from participation because we have ways that we can do that and ways that we can check for that um, that also still allow for participation. Which approach lend its, lends itself best to external evaluators? I would say all of these approaches can be used by external evaluators. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the choices, the factors that you should consider when choosing approaches. And so I really think it's about finding the approach that's the right fit for your context, including the qualifications, the assumptions, the beliefs, the expertise that the evaluation team carries. Okay, um, the next question is about the difference between approaches and methods and that it's not always clear um, if they're really that different. So as a follow up, um, the example is appreciative inquiry, so it could be considered both an approach and a method. You know, I think this terminology, uh, particularly within the field of evaluation, gets used really differently in different presentations, in different books, in different writings, between approaches, methods, theories, right, is another one you see put in there. I think the difference that we want to make here in this presentation today is that there are approaches that are unique to evaluation. 
that really separate it from other types of research or inquiry, right? But that there are something that's specific to evaluation um, practice, right? That make it different. You know, we talked about the difference between research questions and evaluative questions earlier. Um, and so in terms of your question about appreciative inquiry, often we do think about that as a type of evaluation approach, but it's something that you could also use as a type of research method, right? So it does get a little uh, blurry in terms of the definitions. We do have uh, additional resources we'll share that have an extended discussion about these differences I think can help as well. Thank you. When you're doing theory-based evaluation for a program that already has a logic model, uh, for example, from the grant proposal, do you recreate a second one using your own independent needs assessment uh, slash logic model development, or do you use theirs and why? So I would say this, it depends um, how good the model is to begin with um, and um, what the context of the evaluation is. Um, oftentimes we use, we know that programs evolve and are often implemented differently than what we originally thought in our grant proposal. And because of that, we want to take a critical look at the logic model and want to see whether that model needs to be refined. Um, we always would do that in collaboration with, you know, the project staff and other people that are involved and have an interest in the program to really actually evaluate what the program is rather than what we hoped it would be when we wrote the proposal. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Daniela. And Fawn says, yes, that does answer the question. Uh, that's all the questions we have for this break, but please remember we do have another question break coming up. So go ahead and uh, add questions anytime in the chat and we will uh, answer those after the next section. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for those really great questions. So the next approach that we're going to look at is called the nation to nation evaluation approach. So this approach really should be used when you're engaging with indigenous communities, including tribal colleges. So evaluations that take place in different tribal or first nations should be driven by the unique political, cultural, and community requirements of that tribal nation. They're not explicit linear or uh, steps that we've been, like we've been talking about for other approaches to conducting a culturally responsive indigenous evaluation. Instead, there are several core tenants and unique practices that are important when talking about this approach. So first, it's important to recognize the inherent political and legal rights of indigenous communities. The sovereignty of tribal nations has direct implications for evaluation practice. This includes obtaining approvals from tribal leaders to engage in any kind of evaluative effort. It also means using tribal IRBs and tribal councils to review and approve studies. Further honoring the rights and sovereignty of indigenous nations includes using tribal national ordinances and policies, engaging tribal PIs and co-PIs, and using tribal theories, methods, and evidence-based models throughout your evaluation. So the nation to nation approach written extensively by Dr. Nicole Bowman is specific to the Lunape Mohegan people. So this approach draws from the traditional four doors of the Lunapi Mohegan medicine wheel. Each door in the four cardinal directions calls upon the evaluation team to honor key aspects of indigenous thinking and values. For example, the door to the east calls evaluation teams to honor traditional knowledge, rights, and responsibilities. The door to the south calls the evaluation team to honor oral and other histories, treaty rights, and other traditional agreements. Dr. Bowman continues to expand on this approach, growing the four doors into describing how the seven directions, so including north, south, east, and west, inward, upward, downward, and inward, um, influences decision-making throughout an evaluation. She beautifully entwines elements of nature, their traditional meanings, and how evaluation can be conducted in a way that honors, respects, and engages indigenous communities. 
Nation to nation evaluations are distinguished by a commitment to honoring traditional elder wisdom and practical knowledge. A nation to nation evaluation is, is inseparable from indigenous values and centers indigenous thinking at every step. Some important aspects of this include viewing impacts and consequences through the next seven generations, being caretakers of knowledge, not just owners of knowledge. So in this approach, evaluation is seen as a process of learning and improvement. So Dr. Bowman actually acknowledges that there was no direct translation for the English term evaluate in the Lunape Mohegan language. Instead, she shares from an elder, a tribal elder, that something happens, something that happens is not good or bad, it just is, and we have an opportunity to learn from it. So this means that a nation to nation evaluation approach would not make explicit valuing claims in their evaluative conclusions. In this approach, evaluation is seen as a tool for transformation, improvement and empowerment to address chronic social issues and concerns within the indigenous community. Evaluations must be conducted for some direct benefit for the indigenous community. Nation to nation evaluations go beyond a collaborative approach to recognize that decision making power throughout the evaluation resides with tribal community leaders. This is reflected in the use of tribal IRBs and tribal councils to review evaluation activities and findings. So let's look at how this may show up in the hypothetical example we've been talking about today. So this time, the advancing technology technical skills in renewable energy project is being implemented in a region where local indigenous communities are involved. The basic activities of the project are the same. However, the project and the evaluation are conducted will need to be responsive to the values and rights of the indigenous communities. So as an evaluator using a nation to nation approach, what is the most appropriate first step in evaluating this project? So I'll stay quiet for a minute as you read the responses on the screen. And then when you're ready, you can respond in the poll that will show up on the right hand side of your screen. I see approach, I see responses coming in. We have about 70% of the audience who've responded so far. I'll give you another minute. So as I can see, and hopefully you can see the results of the poll as well, that most people are choosing C, right? Convene a series of consultation meetings with community elders and leaders to co-develop the evaluation framework. Yeah. So that's really where you would wanna start, right? Or even before you start, that's what you wanna be doing, right? And some of you may be thinking that this is actually in direct contrast with the way evaluations are typically planned for grant proposals. Often, at least in the NSF ATE program, we see that the project team or a single evaluator is writing an evaluation plan for a proposal without much um, input from the community members. But to be truly responsive to Indigenous rights and values, it's important to begin this conversation before you even begin to write a grant proposal, you know, before you even start thinking about those activities, and certainly before you start writing that evaluation plan. So some of you may be uh, thinking that you're not going to find yourself using this approach because you don't happen to be working with Indigenous communities. But I do want to point out that we know a number of ATE projects are hosted at or collaborate with tribal colleges. And even if you're not working directly with Indigenous communities, the nation to nation approach reflects a holistic and culturally embedded way of engaging with concepts of evaluation and project impact that's important to consider in the rest of your work. So we've given a quick overview of these three evaluation approaches. And some of this may have seemed familiar to you. Others of you, this may be completely new. So know that we're not sharing these approaches so that you follow them perfectly, 
but instead we're sharing them to expose different ways of thinking about evaluation that will also help also help you be more intentional about how you make decisions throughout your evaluation. So I'm going to pass it to Daniela to talk more about these considerations. Thank you, Lisa. So with all those approaches, it's not always clear how to choose the right one for a project. Bianca, Lisa, and I have thought about this a lot and want to share the factors that we think you should consider. So there are three main categories of influential factors when it comes to choosing an evaluation approach. The first one thing to consider um, are the assumptions and viewpoints of the project. Every person you work with brings their own beliefs and worldview to a situation. Everyone has ways they see the world and ways they make sense of information. Knowing how your clients, sponsors, project partners, or other interested parties think about the world can strengthen your collaboration, influence the kind of data you might collect, and help avoid unexpected surprises. The second consideration is what kind of data is feasible, realistic, and preferred. Your most likely familiar with quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods in evaluation. For example, you may consider whether you use quantitative numeric information, pictures or stories, or a combination of both. Important in any evaluation is to consider what kind of information you want and need to collect given the available resources and what is more convincing and relatable to the audiences of the evaluation. The third piece are the practical dimensions. These tell us how evaluation approaches are implemented in practice. We identify eight practice dimensions that you should consider. These include questions related to values and valuing an evaluation, um, the stance evaluation takes on issues of advocacy and activism, influences on culture and context, the role of the evaluation in encouraging use, and ultimately dimensions of breadth and depth of engagement, which consider who is engaged throughout the evaluation and in what capacity. We want to organize these influencing factors into a tool for evaluators to reference when deciding how to approach an evaluation. We begin by rating various approaches on each of the influential dimensions. When then, when then visualizing these ratings um, using a flower. So here you see our flower. Each petal on the flower is related to one practical dimension. We use color to identify the worldview and a pattern in the center to communicate preferences on each tradition. Pulling all of these elements together we develop the garden of evaluation approaches. This visual framework and related resources can help you learn about different evaluation approaches and identify which elements will work best for your projects. I'm going to pass it on to Bianca to talk more about the resources and to wrap up things. Thanks, Daniela. The past hour has certainly been a crash course of a lot of information. We want to make sure to leave you with plenty of resources to learn more and some key takeaways. First, we want to share some of the questions we're frequently asked about evaluation approaches. First, do I have to use a formal evaluation approach? No, you don't have to use a formal evaluation approach that is named in the literature. Everyone who conducts or commissions an evaluation has some kind of personal approach to evaluation. Everyone has assumptions, beliefs, and ways of doing that they bring to their work. So then, why should I learn about them? Learning about evaluation approaches, we think, can help you expand your imagination of what is possible in project evaluation. It can also help you to be more intentional in your design choices and how you engage others in implementing the evaluation. 
Another question we get a lot is, can I mix and match evaluation approaches? In fact, we had that question today. <laughs> Let me reassure you that the answer is yes. In fact, research has shown that most people do not stick to a single approach and follow it step by step. Listen, practice is more complex and honestly, a lot messier than that. The garden of evaluation approaches and the dimensions that it brings up, the questions that Daniela went over, can help you identify which approaches complement each other well, the flowers are meant to be overlaid and the petals combined. Finally, are some evaluation approaches better than others? No, as Lissa said earlier, no approach is better, more accurate or stronger than others. They are all different and speak to different needs and beliefs. What you want is to find the approach that best fits your project and its context. Now, like I said, this has been a crash course. And if you're new to evaluation approaches, let's be honest, it can be a bit overwhelming and intimidating. So if that is you, or if you're interested in learning more about the three approaches we talked about today or other approaches to evaluation, we have detailed handouts for multiple evaluation approaches freely available online. We developed these because we wanted to make it less overwhelming, less intimidating, and more helpful for folks like you. We also have a few papers talking more about the evaluation garden framework, one in the American Journal of Evaluation and a newly published paper in the Journal of Multidisciplinary Evaluation. We'll put direct links to all of these resources in the chat box as well. As we reach our final question break today, here are some of the main things we hope you walk away with. We hope you are more aware of the various ways to conduct an evaluation. Project evaluation is not a one size fits all endeavor. We hope you learn some new ways to approach evaluation, considering different ways to engage people and how evaluations might change depending on their context. Remember that evaluation approaches can be combined to find the best fit for the needs of your project. And finally, that reflecting on how and why you make choices throughout the evaluation will strengthen the quality and usefulness of the evaluation. So thanks so much for listening. I'm going to hand it to Samantha to share the questions you've been asking in the chat. Over to you, Samantha. Okay, thank you. All right, first up. So normally who should make a decision on the evaluation approach, the commissioners or evaluators? This is such a great question. Uh, and of course, it always goes to the question of it depends, right? Uh, which is like the worst question in all of evaluation. But at the end of the day, it's the, you know, the real one, right? So I think often in practice, depending on what context you are working in, sometimes we find that commissioners will decide what approach, right? You'll see that listed in an RFP or a call for submissions, right? Um, but of course, we also know that commissioners aren't evaluators. They haven't been trained. They're not necessarily on this webinar today. And so you, there are important expertise that an evaluator can bring in making that decision. So you ask normally who should make a decision, right? I think it's both and. It's a conversation of what information needs are needed in that evaluation and what best fits that context. But of course, in practice, it depends. A lot of like knowing nods over there in the little evaluator <laughs> video boxes. Okay, next up, could the nation to nation approach be used in rural communities where trust can be challenging? Oh, what I love about your question is really pulling out the trust piece, right? And really pulling out that in the nation to nation approach, there is a lot of trust building going on between various communities and groups of people. I will say that that approach as written about is really intended to be about a specific group, right? Some indigenous communities, particularly the Lunape Mohegan. Um, so in moving it to a rural community, there's gonna be a lot of other 
cultural contextual elements that you would want to take into account. So I think I would actually refer you to looking into something like a culturally responsive evaluation approach that really takes that participatory aspect of the nation to nation and has you really uh, immerse yourself in the needs of that community and building that trust. So I love that there is the pullout of the building the trust in terms of going beyond that step of the participatory, the practical participatory in the engagement. And just to know that there are a lot of other approaches out there. And yes, as uh, the esteemed Nikki Bowen, who is actually on our webinar today, mentioned in the chat, she says that many other nations are in rural contexts and we can use it in urban Indian context too. Thank you, Nikki. Okay, what should happen next after each of the evaluation approaches have been used? So good question. Um, so I think it depends on where you are in the process, right? Um, so, you know, if you're at the beginning of the process and you are using a particular approach or you have decided to combine them, right, um, and make make your own flower, right? Your own colorful flower that fits your unique context. Uh, then I think it's really thinking about what is the next step for that flower that you created, right? Or that approach that you chose, right? As we saw through these just really quick examples, the three examples, they all started in very different places, right? So if you're at the beginning, right? What your next step is depends on the approach that you're using, right? Um, it also could be that, you know, sometimes on uh, multi-year evaluations, the approach you start with may not necessarily be the approach you end with, right? And so, you know, it could be that uh, maybe you're towards the end and you need to choose a slightly different approach for a particular reason or you plan to do that, right? So then, you, you know, you would think about where you were and you would take stock of what you did and then you'd move on to the next phase, right? And maybe that next phase looks different. Um, you don't necessarily, let me say, you don't necessarily have to use all of these approaches in any one evaluation, right? Um, so there are some people in the community that do use a particular approach and they think about what it looks like to translate that into practice. There are others, as we saw at the beginning when we asked you the question about which approaches do you use, right? There are others who sort of, you know, mix and match and pick and choose depending on the context and the project um, and all of those kinds of things. So really great question. Thank you. Okay, uh, from Joy, we didn't talk about collaborative evaluation today, but I find it feels like it overlaps extensively with participatory and utilization focused evaluation. Is there a time or situation when you would recommend one of these over another? So we are still in the midst of um, classifying all of these different approaches. And at this time, we have focused specifically on participatory evaluation. We have not yet coded utilization focused or uh, collaborative evaluation. We know there is a lot of approaches out there with, that have a lot of overlap. And we hope that these categorizations and these flowers will actually show that there are differences or will show the nuances. So far, all the approaches we have coded are very different from one another, even the ones that we thought that would be very related to each other. So we'll have to look and see. Uh, one, oh, sorry, I was gonna say one example of that that we have coded that I think is helpful for bringing this up is um, we talked about today the practical participatory evaluation approach. The other flower we coded was the transformative practical participatory approach, right? So very similar names, but actually when you read about them and you read the scholarship, those flowers look very different. They are rooted in very different ideas um, and values. And so, yeah, we, we think and hope once we get it, uh, as Daniela said, you'll be able to see those. Uh, but for the ones that we have, you, even ones that have very, very close names, you start to see these differences. I also wanted to call attention to one of the reasons we were drawn to the garden metaphor. Um, you know, when we say evaluation approaches, these are not, you know, done deals, 
right? Like these are not things that like the field of evaluation hasn't been around long enough to have really uh, structured, agreed upon approaches, right? And so the garden then allows us to recognize that these approaches, these strategies are still growing, they're transforming, they're evolving. So the handouts that we've coded so far are really based on existing writing, right? And so that can be very easily out of date, right? Because we know that a lot of folks thinking about these different approaches to evaluation are still thinking about it and their ideas and their concepts and their experiences are still growing. And so we certainly see these flowers growing and transforming as those approaches grow as well. But right now, you know, it's kind of just a snapshot of where we're at, but also with room to grow. I wanna follow up on that. So for example, we see a lot of approaches that don't talk much about val values and valuing within their literature at all. And we show that in a flower. And that does not necessarily mean that values and valuing and evaluation doesn't matter to these approaches. It just means it hasn't been written about in a way that we could integrate it into our classification with, you know, like our justification and stuff. So we hope one of the things that will come out of, of our project is that a lot of people will continue to develop their own approaches and that the literature based on how we can do evaluation will, will expand and therefore the flowers will change over time as well, right? I mean, some may lose a leaf or a bit of a leaf while others um, may get an additional leaf. I don't know. So um, we'll see as we as we go. But we really hope that we put some development into the field um, related to evaluation theory. It's a living garden. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, OK, that is, we do actually have just one last question uh, wondering, uh, where are each of the separate approaches? And uh, I believe you showed them earlier, but just where people can locate them. Yeah, so if the, the tiny URL link, which I, I saw in the chat, some folks are having trouble opening, but Maureen also put just the straight up open science framework. So if you've never been on open science framework, essentially it is a place for researchers to um, put documents about their studies and what they're doing in order to encourage transparency, right? So some people put data sets up there, some people put preprints of papers, um, but we've been using it as a place to really hold the handouts that we've developing, been developing, along with someone also asked about what the specific definitions for these dimensions are and what the ratings are. So there's a rubric with all of that information on that page as well. Um, so that page is a little bit tricky to navigate, but essentially in the file structure that you can see on the left side of the page, as soon as you get to a spot that has a little PDF icon and it'll say something like um, theory-driven evaluation approach, if you click on that, it'll open the specific approach handout and you can download it from there. So play around in there. If you still don't find what you're looking for, please send us an email um, and we can help you get whatever you're looking for. But another note to say that this is something that we are still actively working on. And so not only will new um, approaches be rated and added to that collection online, but we are also in this process of really um, thinking about what it means to develop your own flower, right? So having some type of structured reflection practice that you can sit down, ask yourself some questions, um, and then rate your own preferences and expertise and assumptions on these different dimensions. And then something that you can do the same with your project, thinking about the context that you want to enact that evaluation in ways that then allows you to look at the overlap, the gaps, the, you know, um, what it means to bring these together and then how you can pull from different approaches that are out there to meet the needs of that project. So more to come. Okay, well, thank you all very much. That's the end of our questions for today.